Spider-Man, Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. We all know the words, even though they came from a series that's nearing 60 years old. For many, Spider-Man's first animated series in 1967 was their introduction to the character and many of his villains, and understandably so, Spider-Man debuted in the comics only five years prior to this TV series hitting the airwaves. These days, while the show has iconic elements, it's taken on new life as a bit of a meme factory thanks to social media. But what about the actual content of the show? Is it a worthwhile adaptation of the character and his stories? There's only one way to find out. Let's start at the beginning one last time. Earth 67. Spider-Man 1967 had a fascinating production life. At the time the series began, there were only around 50 issues of The Amazing Spider-Man that existed, which may not sound like a lot, but the majority of Spidey's most iconic villains were introduced during this era. However, the series also had an incredibly small budget, which, if you've ever seen the show, you're probably aware of. Recycled animations, stiff movements, and very limited number of characters made these low budgets very noticeable. The show itself, interestingly, can be split into two distinct eras. Season 1, which was produced under Grand Trey Lawrence Animation, and Seasons 2 and 3, which were produced under Krantz Films and showrun by legendary animator Ralph Bakshi, best known for his Lord of the Rings adaptation and X-rated animated film Fritz the Cat. We'll talk about these two eras separately because each have their pros and cons, and each feel quite a bit different from one another. Grand Trey Lawrence produced 20 episodes for Season 1, though most episodes featured two stories apiece, so there were actually 38 separate stories throughout the first season's run. But right off the bat, you can feel the limited budget in action. Though Peter lives and fights crime in New York City, the city itself is completely desolate. As far as supporting characters go, it's rare that we see anyone in Peter's life outside of his boss, Jonah Jameson, and co-worker Betty Brandt, with the occasional episode featuring Aunt May. In fact, though they had 50 issues to draw from, countless characters didn't make the cut. They didn't introduce Peter's most iconic love interests, Gwen Stacy or Mary Jane Watson, though they did have him pretty persistently fumble attempts to woo Betty Brandt. Though Peter is constantly referred to as a teenager, we never see him at school or socializing. He's always just working working for the Bugle as a photographer, which is especially funny when Jameson is constantly complaining about teenagers, but the only two people he seemingly works with are teenagers. You can't trust a teenager to do a job. He's goofing off, no doubt. Then why did you hire so many teenagers, Jonah? Jameson is a really interesting character in the series. Obviously, we all know that JJ thinks Spidey is a menace and is constantly writing editorial attacks against him, but he's a bit flanderized in this portrayal, likely because they needed to have some consistent antagonistic force against Spidey, but it tends to get very silly. There are so many instances where no matter what obvious evidence is presented to JJ, he refuses to believe that Spider-Man isn't the culprit for whatever crime has been committed. And you know, it's not that I don't think this fits his character, it's just that it's part of nearly every single episode of the show. It's kind of his only thing in this. We do get plenty of episodes featuring Spidey's most iconic villains, including Vulture, Mysterio, Doc Ock, Green Goblin, The Lizard, Electro, etc. While a few of those stories are pretty direct adaptations of their comic book origins, all of them are stripped down from their printed counterparts, and many barely resemble them at all. Take Green Goblin, for instance. While we see Green Goblin in multiple stories, there is zero indication that his identity is Norman Osborn, and there is no Harry Osborn in Peter's life in this either. In fact, for some reason, in multiple episodes, Goblin keeps returning to this castle-like house to steal magic-related items. A book of witchcraft in the first one, and magic secrets from a local magician named Blackwell in the next. It's very weird. What a career of crime I could carve if I had Blackwell's talent. The Lizard is an interesting case, introduced in an episode called Where Crawls the Lizard, stealing a cover tagline from Amazing Spider-Man issue 4. Just like in the Lizard's original introduction in TASM issue 6, this story sends Spidey to the swamps of Florida to investigate the mysterious monster. Though, rather than his more nuanced portrayal in the comics, they make him a bit of a Saturday morning cartoon villain. I'm a lizard man and the swamps belong to me. But the broad strokes are basically the same. Spidey investigates, meets the Connors family, and then discovers that Kirk Connors is the one who became the lizard. Though, for some reason, this iteration eliminates the whole arm regrowth origin and instead replaces it with Connors researching something called swamp fever. Very random choice. Maybe they just didn't know how to animate a one-armed character? But this is a good example of some of the more direct adaptations that Spidey 67 manages. Because of their budget and resource limitations, they needed to really strip the stories down. 
Scorpion's origin is probably the best example of a direct adaptation for the series. Though still stripped down a bit, this episode basically hits all of the major beats for Amazing Spider-Man issue 20. Jameson pays Dr. Stillwell to create the Scorpion to overpower Spider-Man. Scorpion starts to lose control of himself and goes on a crime spree, and eventually Scorpion goes directly after Jameson, who needs to be saved by Spider-Man. There are a few different beats here and there, but the core of that story is exactly the same. Though it is cool to see these handfuls of instances where the original comic book stories are mostly adapted to the TV format. In general, Spidey's rogues gallery definitely lacks the nuance and backstory that makes them so compelling in the comic books and later adaptations. It makes for a fun Saturday morning cartoon experience for kids, but a somewhat disappointing one for fans of those characters. But the real charm of this Spider-Man series came when they weren't using his comic book rogues gallery, instead opting for some of the silliest and most insane original villains I've ever seen. The second story of the entire series sees Spidey face off against ice golems from Pluto, and he has to help them fix their ship so they can get back home. Here's a shot of the iceberg as it begins to fly away. Now it's a flying iceberg! In another episode, Spidey stumbles across a giant metal-eating robot who is probably one of my favorite designs for anything in this entire show. The episode doesn't really even explain anything about the monster's origins either. It just kind of shows up and starts eating metal. It means there's a monster on the loose one who eats metal to live. In another, in what I presume was a cost-cutting measure, Spidey has to fight a literal invisible villain named Noah Body. Sign, Dr. Noah Body. Noah Body. Nobody. That's it. Nobody. One of my favorites was this guy who made wax figures named Parafino and then used those wax figures like robots to commit crimes. Absolutely bizarre, but there is a great episode where Spidey faces off against all of these historical villains like Blackbeard the Pirate and Jesse James. Put your hands up, Spider-Man. But it was Jesse James. And as it turned out, these were all wax figures sent to do crime by Parafino. Wild stuff. There are a couple episodes with these twin villains called the Human Flies, who are obviously just a color swapped Spider Man model, but I actually really like these designs. It's like a simple Spidey Sona. The Fifth Avenue Phantom is another that I had a blast watching. Basically, this Phantom guy uses store mannequins who also have the power to shrink things for some reason. So they shrink merchandise at fancy stores that they belong to because they're mannequins. Mannequins. Then they put those things in a bag and bring them back to the Phantom, where they then put them on a conveyor belt and unshrink them. Not even sure why they're on a conveyor belt. But man, this next one destroyed me. There's an episode where Spidey goes out to investigate an apparent ghost at an old theater that's going out of business. As it turns out, a few people who run and perform in the theater are behind these ghost sightings, and they beat and tie up Spider-Man and force him to watch a magic act. And as it turns out, they basically were just trying to sell Spider-Man on saving the theater. Correct. Spider-Man, this performance was for your benefit. Our motive? to save the old castle theater. This has gotta be my favorite way somebody has ever asked for Spider-Man's help in anything. Like he's just some kind of investment banker. Amazing stuff. The series even sometimes combine the classic villains with their weird original ones. Towards the end of season one, Dr. Noah Body sneaks into prison and frees Electro, Green Goblin, and Vulture. This is another funny example of how weird the world of this show is. All of the villains are just still wearing their costumes, including Green Goblin. There's something deeply cursed about seeing Green Goblin sleeping under the covers in full goblin garb. This is actually a really fun episode. Spidey struggles to face off against three of his toughest foes, so he basically tricks them into defeating each other. But it's still funny that Dr. Noah Body was the mastermind behind it all. I can see you, but you can't see me! Yeah, but he can see that gun you're holding, Doctor. Season 1 is a real mixed bag, delivering some pretty solid but stripped down comic book adaptations and far more hilarious and silly original villain capers. But why has it become memed to death in subsequent years? Do 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 Ugh. Well, there are a lot of reasons, and honestly, after watching, I'm shocked it isn't more memed. Just about every single example of a memed moment from the series comes in the first season, and most of them stem from shortcuts that needed to be taken due to the small budgets. There are countless funny shots of Spider-Man just doing very normal things. The first time we see him in the entire show, he's driving a car down a cliff that's being suspended by his own webs? Doesn't even make sense physically. In addition to Spidey being in very un-Spidey-like scenarios, like driving tractors or sitting at an office desk, the show features some of the silliest and most ridiculous poses you can imagine, and many of them end up being reused over and over. I mean, look at this one in the Fifth Avenue Phantom. This is just so funny to me. More time and money would have allowed them to clean up the sillier looking drawings, but they were on tight budgets and tight schedules. There are also a shocking number of sequences where Spider-Man just walks somewhere. 
They obviously had limited number of swinging cycles, but it's funny to see Spidey just casually walking during some kind of criminal activity or crisis. And when we do get run cycles for Spidey and for other characters, they're generally very funny looking. Other corner cutting aspects of this season are even less forgivable. For one, the movements are just generally very slow. Now this may have been to pad for time because they had to fill 11 minutes with minimal story, but when we do see Spidey swinging, whether it's traveling across New York or swooping down to kick a villain, it is so slow. Just a glow glacial pace. On top of this, they often had to verbalize things that were happening instead of actually show them in any kind of interesting way via animation, which led to both repetitive and boring storytelling and uninteresting resolutions. So many episodes boil down to a villain committing some kind of crime, Spider-Man verbally being framed for it, and then being forced to catch the villain to clear his own name. Multiple episodes are resolved when Peter goes home and makes a new special kind of webbing with his chemistry set that magically has the ability to stop the villain at large. Electric webbing, metal webbing, etc. Etc. But these new webbings have absolutely nothing visually to distinguish them from normal webbing. He just announces that they have X special property and then it stops the villain. There is absolutely no visual for when Spidey activates his Spidey sense. It's another thing he just announces. How did you? My spider sense. But also, there are so many instances in the show where he clearly should be using a Spidey sense. It's actually kind of wild how often Spider-Man is bested by completely pedestrian attempts to thwart him. He is constantly getting knocked out, constantly getting tied up. In one episode, he is roped up by a cowboy three separate times. In some episodes, he literally just gets his foot stuck somewhere and can't get out. There are multiple occasions where he stumbles or is knocked off a building and just falls all the way to the ground. Dude, your whole thing is so swinging through the skyscrapers and sticking to walls. How are you falling roof to street in New York City? Honestly, it makes the Spider-Man look completely inept a lot of the time, and I think it's just because their lack of budget didn't allow them to craft more creative ways for Spidey to be bested. It almost always came down to something silly or easy to animate. This also extended to Spider-Man's use of web, beyond the specialized stuff I mentioned earlier. Spidey is constantly crafting full solid objects to use with his webbing instead of fighting like Spider-Man. He fights with a sword he made out of his web in one episode, he hits Goblin's pumpkin bomb back at him with a web baseball bat in another, and in a Dr. Octopus episode, he hits him through a window with a web slingshot? And I don't mean that he like slingshotted something with his web, he created a slingshot out of his web. Like the kind Dennis the Menace carries around. Dude, you literally shoot web, why are you creating a different object to shoot web with? It doesn't make any sense. I'm surprised that these things aren't meme or talked about more often. A supercut of clips of Spider-Man getting knocked out or bested by the simplest of enemies would be really long and really funny. While these things, while they make for a poor adaptation of the character and his abilities, also make for a very fun and silly watching experience. Honestly, I recommend getting together with some friends and just throwing on some of this series because it's a blast to laugh at, at least for season one, because things take a drastic turn for season two. After Grand Trey Lawrence Animation went out of business, the series was continued by Krantz Films and show run by aforementioned legend Ralph Bakshi. And though the series' budget was slashed even further, Bakshi's artistry managed to shine through in multiple ways. Honestly, season 2 of Spider-Man 1967 might as well have been an entirely different series, in good ways and bad. The series itself instantly looked significantly better, utilizing incredibly detailed psychedelic sky backgrounds and also wildly more impressive establishing shots of New York. Suddenly, the show was just infinitely more interesting to look at. But it didn't stop there. Immediately, we visit new locations, like Peter's school, we see tons of background characters. No more of those desolate, empty New York City spaces from season one. Now it's a fully populated world that actually feels lived in. The animation is still limited, given the budgets and time constraints, but the background characters actually existing go such a long way to make this show feel bigger and more fleshed out. And Bakshi came out of the gate swinging. One of the other reasons season two feels like a new show is because it actually just begins with Spider-Man's origin. And this is far and away the most faithfully adapted comic book story in the entire 1967 series. They hit just about every single beat of Spidey's origin from Amazing Fantasy 15, but did so with its own sense of style. We see Peter's struggling social life at school, then goes straight to the experiment that makes the spider radioactive, leading Peter to getting bit. He discovers his ability and tests them out, tries to use them to make some money to help out Ben and May, and of course, lets this criminal go. A scene we've seen play out in countless Spider-Man adaptations at this point, though this one actually seems to be the closest to the original. In fact, they directly pull this entire line of dialogue right out of Amazing Fantasy 15. Sorry, pal. I'm through being pushed around. From now on, I look out for number one. 
and that means me. In the comics, Peter learns about Ben's death from a cop when he arrives home. He doesn't watch him die like we've seen in many of the other adaptations, and that's exactly how they play it in this episode as well. He then tracks down the criminal, realizes it was his fault all along, and pledges to do better and be better. It's the most direct adaptation of the comic book that's ever existed. And, to this point, this is easily the best animated episode of the series as well. They truly do the story justice and look good doing it. The trippy new backgrounds go a long way, but the actual new locations go even further. Even with limited animation, they manage to use color, silhouette, and shading to really bring this thing to life. The scene with the experiment that radiates the spider is a great example of limited movement still showcasing impeccable style and using color to your advantage in storytelling. There's a really quick shot when Spidey is approaching the criminal that killed Ben that I gasped at. The background and lighting on Spidey just looked so great. In so many ways, the second season just felt like a massive upgrade to what came before. However, it didn't come without its own cons. Now instead of producing two stories for a single 30 minute time slot, they were producing a single story for that same time slot. This works for episodes like The Origin of Spider-Man, the season 2 premiere, but tons of episodes are padded with these long, extended swinging sequences. And though the sequences look a lot more interesting because of the upgraded backgrounds, they still use recycled swinging animations from season 1 and end up super repetitive because of how often they're used to fill time. Season 2 also did away with just about every original Spidey villain from the comics that we saw back in season 1, opting for even more original villains. And in more cost-cutting measures, they use recycled animation from different series entirely, but we'll get to that later. So while I feel season 2 is still a lot more interesting from an artistic standpoint than season 1, it isn't necessarily a more faithful adaptation overall, because it basically was forced to go off into entirely different directions from the comics even more often. Except for these first couple of episodes, which were really great examples of Spider-Man content. The origin of Spider-Man is for sure the best episode of the series when we're talking about true Spider-Man adaptations, but the second episode, Kingpin, is also excellent. And it makes season 2 feel even more like it's its own series, because it picks up right where the first episode left off, and even shows Peter getting his job at the Bugle so he can help May make ends meet after Ben's death. In fact, we also start to see other people who work at the Bugle, finally! It's not just Jameson and a couple teenagers trying to snap pictures of stuff, it feels like a real publication, with reporters. It fixes a lot of the issues I had with how the show felt back in season 1. The one actual comic book Spidey villain season 2 introduces is in this episode, Kingpin, and honestly, they mostly do him justice. It's a good design and a solid performance. Cockroach! I could have crushed you with my bare hands, but that would have been messy. Obviously not using nearly any of Spidey's comic book villains, Season 2 maintains Season 1's habit of inventing entirely new ones, to varying degrees of success. In general, I think I had more fun watching Season 1's new villains because they were sillier, but Season 2 does manage to have a handful of pretty cool storylines. Like when this guy named The Master Technician creates an anti-gravity device to raise the entire island of Manhattan into the sky. The visual is honestly pretty great, and I liked seeing Spidey swing under the floating island. And honestly, there are still some really fun, silly Spidey adventures in this season. He straight up fights a gorilla in one episode. In another, an ancient sorcerer is revived at a museum and summons a demon that attacks Peter's classmates. But my absolute favorite in season 2 is Pardo Presents, an episode where this weird guy hypnotizes an entire theater audience into giving him their valuables, somehow utilizing this giant cat. There's some wild visuals, like the gas shooting out of the cat's eye on the movie screen to hypnotize the audience. But the absolute highlight is the giant black cat chasing Spider-Man around the city, truly some of my favorite funny visuals in the entire series. Spidey basically has to fight this cat kaiju and electrocutes him on a bridge. It's kind of brutal, but cool. In another episode, Peter is randomly on a foreign exchange student program flying in a plane over the Andes, and his plane crashes, leading Spidey to face off against a 15th century conquistador named De Vargas. My favorite thing about this episode is that as soon as the plane crashes, Peter disappears and Spider-Man appears, but the three people he's with do not suspect at all that they might be the same people. Uh, uh, I saw the whole thing from here. Yes, my boy. Some of these stories did tend to get repetitive though, because literally one episode later, Peter gets in another plane crash? Even funnier, this is a Daily Bugle branded plane. JJ just sends Peter and one other employee to fly a plane to get photos. Wild. As I mentioned earlier, in order to cut down the budget, the series also started to reuse tons of assets from one of Bakshi's other series, Rocket Robin Hood. The episodes that do this end up feeling like entirely different series, but they, at the very least, are incredibly cool to look at. Truly some of the trippiest and most psychedelic imagery I've ever seen in 
a superhero show. However, they really just don't feel anything like Spider-Man stories. There's not one, but two episodes where Spidey goes deep underground and faces off against the society of lion ape looking underground people. The episode Phantom from the Depths of Time has some particularly cool imagery, but features giant bugs, this Igor guy who looks like an entirely different animation style, Spidey flying a rocket, and fighting a giant magma monster. As interesting as it is sometimes, it's just not Spider-Man. But even with these wild stories not based on comic books, they do manage to try and incorporate more of Peter Parker's life slash hero balance into the stories. In one episode, Peter wants to try out for football so he can impress girls at school, but is pretty instantly rejected by the coach. By the end of the episode, he has to save the star quarterback and then helps him cheat to win the big game. I love this shot of Spidey just looking sad on top of the scoreboard. Ray, team Ray. Boy, am I a 14 karat gold plated sap. Though I would say that these types of stories don't always make Peter look good. There's an episode where Peter asks out his classmate Susan, who tells him she's busy. Wow. I wonder why Susan is always busy when I ask her for a date. Bet she'd change her mind if she knew I'm really Spider-Man. But then, even after he's rejected, he shows up to see her while she's on another date. That is some incel behavior, Pete. She does still let him hang out with them, though. One of the most fascinating episodes of season two actually involves Peter's love life and some wild original characters. For some reason, the beginning of this episode, Peter is reading the newspaper at a club while everyone is dancing. His classmate Sonia even asks him to dance, and he says no. Read about proton devices when the world is full of beautiful chicks. Pete, you have a lot to learn. He's right, Pete. What the hell are you doing? Doing, is what I thought at first, because this girl named Carol is actually real turned on by his science talk. I just moved to the city. Perhaps you can show me around. I love how stoked on Carol Peter is in this episode. He's literally just swinging around New York talking about how excited he is to see Carol. But twist, he catches Carol stealing some science equipment, and she has spider powers too. She seems to know Peter's identity and literally has all of the abilities he does, including Spidey Sense and web shooters. This has got to be one of the earliest instances of Spidey meeting another person with his abilities. And I like that it's a potential love interest, one that's committing crimes no less. That's good drama. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the rest of the episode really flies off the rails. It's revealed that Carol is an alien and her species is stealing equipment so that they can get home. There is literally no other explanation for the spider powers, kind of just turns into another thing entirely. But it was interesting for a minute. The end of season two actually also introduces Captain Stacy, though his first name is Ned in this for some reason. He's taken hostage by a group of prisoners and Spidey has to rescue him. Not a bad premise, but it's weird that they just barely introduce some of these legacy characters late in the show. Season two represents some of the best of this entire series, but also flies off into wild directions that barely resemble Spider-Man at all. It's a real mixed bag, but it's at least really cool to look at, and it's substantially better than season three. Sadly, this series ends on a real low note. For the final season of Spider-Man 1967, budgets were slashed even further. The one pro is that this meant the return of the classic villains we saw in season one, but only through completely recycling not just footage from season one, but often the entire storylines. The first episode is a vulture story, and though they change out some backgrounds, the animation is exactly the same as what we saw in the season one episode The Sky is Falling, down to the resolution involving this guy's vultures turning on him. Even though they had nothing to do with this story in the first place, it's kind of a mess. The new Lizard episode is even worse. It's truly almost beat for beat the exact same story as Where Crawls the Lizard from season one, except this time they literally just remove the actual comic book twist entirely through dialogue. The Lizard is not Kurt Connors, he's just an intelligent lizard who kidnapped Kurt Connors, and it's played as though Peter has to save Kurt from the Lizard. However, they didn't have the footage to actually show this, so they clumsily explain where the lizard disappears to through dialogue. Not only did it take away his intelligence, it took away him. Now to find Connors. They do this a few times in season three, but not only do they recycle animation and stories from season one, they actually reuse stuff from season two as well, which wasn't even very Spidey-like to begin with. Nearly this entire season is just a weird mishmash of older stories recycled in unsatisfying ways. There are a few standouts, however. There's a pretty fun episode where Spidey faces off against a giant electrified snowman monster, and another where he faces off against this guy named Desperado, who has gotta be one of my favorite designs in the series. What a fantastic getup! cowboy on an electronic horse. And I sort of lied earlier because they actually do, for a single episode, introduce Mary Jane Watson. She gets hired as a go-go dancer at a club that's run by Kingpin in Times Square, and she does seem to be pretty into Peter. Hey, PDO. Why don't you drop in tonight? I dig watching you watching me dance. No? 
I think I will. Weirdly, they also explain that she's Captain Stacy's niece, so it sort of seems like they were combining the Mary Jane and Gwen Stacy characters here in their own way. But strangely, the character model they use for Captain Stacy in this episode is entirely different than the last one. Speaking of different character models, one of the weirdest episodes of the third season is called The Madness of Mysterio, which also uses an entirely different character model for Mysterio. He's just this turtleneck wearing green skinned dude who smokes. It's actually very bizarre. The cost cutting measures could not have been more apparent in season three. And this is a huge aspect of their most infamous episode, Revolt in the Fifth Dimension. While many other episodes recycled assets from Bakshi's series Rocket Robin Hood, this episode used a full seven minutes of one of their episodes and clumsily inserted Spider-Man into it. On top of that, the footage was so psychedelic and out there that ABC outright refused to air the episode. It's an absolutely fascinating piece of TV history and worth a watch for the psychedelia alone. Spider-Man 1967 ended on a sad but fitting note. The series finale, Trip to Tomorrow, is a full-on clip show, utilizing sequences from three separate episodes. The only new footage involves Spidey falling into this boxcar and giving advice to this young kid that's running away from home. You think I could become a real crime fighter like you? Sure you could. It's easy. It wasn't good advice, but it was advice. So yeah, it's a genuine shame that the finale of the series was the most recycled of its history, a weak clip show from only a few episodes. The final sequence shows the young boy head home instead of running away, and Spider-Man laughing at him pretty weirdly. Honestly, this might be the most fitting way for the series to end, with a strange laugh during the most cost-cutting episode in the show's history. The very first animated Spider-Man show is truly one of the strangest that exists, but largely due to forces outside of its control. It felt like they tried their best to adapt a handful of classic stories, but ultimately, the budget restraints prevented it from embracing Spider-Man's short comic book history as thoroughly as it could have. Combine that with the production woes that transitioned them to a new studio, and the result is one of the most interesting but uneven Spidey series in history. A show that manages to have some wildly impressive adaptations of the comics, like Bakshi's debut with the origin of Spider-Man, but also some absolutely bonkers and confusing stories recycled out of entirely different shows. I will say, despite the general mess that the series is, it wasn't often boring. And though I don't think I could in good conscience recommend this as a quality Spider-Man show, outside of a few episodes, I definitely recommend it as a wild relic of 60s animation. There will never be anything else like it in animated Spider-Man history. You find Folks, thanks for tuning in to another Spider-Man retrospective. If you like this, make sure to check out the other ones I've done. I've done the 90s show, Spider-Man Unlimited, the MTV series, Spectacular Spider-Man. I've talked about the end of the Spider-Verse movies and the live action movies. Check them all out. And of course, stay tuned for more. I've got lots of Spider-Man stuff planned. Peace. I stay mellow watching Johnny two cellos. He talks cartoons, he's a really cool fellow. He keeps you posted on adult cartoons. If that's what you're into, then grab a spoon and a very big bowl of your favorite cereal. Feels like Saturday morning cartoon material. Johnny two cellos, watch him on YouTube. Now enjoy this groove and bust a move.